Hello, everyone. Well, while I was in America, of course, I was looking at many museum ships. But there are other things in the States that it's much, much easier to do than they are over here in the UK. And it turns out that when some of those interesting things, like historic firearms, coincide with naval history, which in this case they do, because various ships had many weapons aboard, and they also coincide with some of the most wonderful people I've met on that side of the pond, well, many new and fascinating things can be learned, such as, can a Brit shoot straight? Just how many rifles and pistols did the Royal Navy employ in the First World War? And of course, can a man with airsoft as trigger discipline survive a whole day out on a range? Well, thanks to Athias and the superb crew behind Sea and Arsenal, we are able to find out the answers to all of these questions. So sit back and relax as we look at the naval small arms of the Royal Navy of World War I. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is a collaboration. During his trip to the United States, your favorite naval historian, Drakenefeld, made a stop in Charleston. Unfortunately, the schedule was a bit compressed, so we rushed him to the range and skipped out on the in-studio boring bits. Now, we could have rolled out the red carpet, grabbed all the coolest guns we could find, but that wouldn't have captured the... Let us say Unique Panic of the Great War, a period of history we've been covering in detail over at Sea and Arsenal. Instead, we treated him to the true British naval experience, handing him as many of their emergency service firearms as we could find. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a show about making do in a pinch. Yes, we will let him handle what would have been standard issue, but we're also going to see a lot of substitute firearms. That's because the Army was far more sensitive to logistics issues than the Navy, at least as far as small arms are concerned. If you fill up a ship with the same rifle and the appropriate ammunition before it sets sail, there really isn't a problem, even if the next ship over is using a different cartridge or a different gun. So early in the war, many naval Lee Enfields would be passed to the Army and replaced with well, all sorts of things, as we'll see. But let's start off with the official rifle, of course. British, short, magazine Lee Enfield, Mark III, star. At the start of the war, Britain's standard rifle across the board was the Smelly Mark III. However, there would soon not be enough to go around, and a simplified pattern was introduced. No windage on the rear sight, no volley sight, and often no more magazine cutoff. Though it appears the British Navy requested it remain on their rifles. That is a uh, Lee Enfield Mark III SMLE, which of course, if you are British, you're genetically pre-programmed to desire to shoot. And uh, oh yeah, lots of hot brass, lots of nice loud reports. <laughs> this was incredibly fun. Canadian Ross Rifle Mark III. This infamous straight pull Canadian rifle thankfully used the same 303 cartridge as a Lee Enfield, mostly. Large numbers were offered up for British use, especially after the Canadian Army units disposed of them. 
Here, we have the original Canadian pattern, but a 100,000 unit contract with the Navy resulted in the addition of a Mark III-B, which uses more rugged sights. Original models appear to be more common with the Merchant Navy. So, that's the Ross rifle, the famous uh, Canadian rifle that had an unerringly distressing habit of sending the bolt straight back into the user's face if you had assembled it wrong. This one, as you may guess from the fact I still have both eyes, was not assembled wrong. So I still have both my face and my eyes, which are very useful. A um, little bit less of a kick than the Lee Enfield. Sight's slightly different as well. Um, Favourite feature of this gun so far, to be honest, is the way the brass ejects. With the Enfield, it's a kind of, uh, in case of ejection, the brass may go here, 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 or here, or possibly on your leg, um, which is slightly distressing. Whereas this one is just like, exit, stage right, brass, high speed. <laughs> so, um, yeah, when it's not taking half your face off, I quite like this rifle. Um, nice report, not tre tremendous amount of kick, as I said, and uh, just a five rounder out of that one. Japanese Arisaka, Type 30. Japan would provide Britain with approximately 150,000 rifles and carbines during the early years of the war. These were a mix of the older Type 30 and the newer Type 38. We've chosen the less numerous and earlier rifle because, of the two, this one was only approved for naval service, whereas the 38 was common. Britain chose to name this the Pattern 1900 rifle, although it was adopted in Japan in 1897. Arasaka Type 30, Japanese gun. Of course, you might be wondering, what on earth am I doing shooting a Japanese gun? Well, Royal Navy in World War I kind of would take pretty much anything they could get their hands on. So, most commonly using the Russo-Japanese War 10 years earlier, but found its way into a number of Royal Navy ships. Of course, the Japanese sending the second, second Special Service Squadron into the Mediterranean, so that's where they would have run into them the most. Royal Australian Navy would also run into these when they were serving alongside the Japanese in the Siege of Sing Tao and various other places. Um, actually, the mildest kick of them all so far, slightly different uh, cartridge setup. It's in metric, because reasons. Um, <laughs> and again, another, uh, well, unlike the Ross, which is straight back and forth, this one's kind of a, like a halfway between the Enfield and the Ross for me, at least. I'm sure fairly, a number of gun aficionados are probably screaming at the screen and throwing things at me right now. But yeah, I'd actually say this is probably the most intuitive to cycle so far. Um, the Enfield probably would be easier, but I'm unfortunately too used to the Airsoft Enfield where the resistance is in, on entirely the wrong motion on the bolt and the Ross going back and forward is with no uh, closing action is just, hmm, something doesn't quite feel right about that. But no, a very, very fun weapon <laughs> and uh, didn't eject brass onto my legs, which is always a plus. Chilean Mauser, Modelo 1912. These and other Mausers in 7mm were taken into service when the British seized several South American warships that were under construction when war broke out. The rifles were already on board, and in a curious twist, they had been produced by a central power, Austria. It appears these were mostly issued to minesweepers and defensively armed merchant ships.
So that was a Chilean Mauser 1912, chambered in seven millimeter. Again, you might be thinking, hang on a minute, we've gone through British gun, Canadian gun, <laughs> a Japanese gun. How on earth is Chile involved? And Mauser, obviously, you know, kind of not on the same side as the Royal Navy in World War I. Well, these were the guns that came with the Chilean battleships Almirante Latore and Almirante Cochrane. Um, Almirante Latore, of course, was completed and saw service in the, in the war as HMS Canada. Almirante Cochrane was not completed, didn't see service during the war, but was converted post-war into the air aircraft carrier HMS Eagle. Uh, but of course, the Chileans weren't under any obligation to buy small arms to go with the ships from Britain. So, as the name suggests, they got them from the continent. And because Almirante Latore was complete, most of her guns were actually there ready to go. So when the British took over the ships, they also got these rifles and a bunch of other small arms with them. Something that uh, people don't tend to often notice is that a lot of battleships will carry well over 500 rifles, as well as other small arms, as well as their conventional armament. Almirante Cochrane, not being completed, hadn't had its rifles delivered. A lot of those rifles remained over in Austria, at which point, you know, well, on opposite sides of the war, the Austrians are like, well, there's some spare rifles, let's have those. So these guns actually see service on both sides of the war. Um, although, obviously, this one, um, I, I quite like it. The sights have worked pretty well on this one. They're fairly low profile. Um, motion on the on the bolt is a little stiffer than some of the other guns but doesn't affect the accuracy all that much and uh, again not being covered in hot brass which is always a plus u.s remington rolling block model 1901 this inexpensive single shot rifle was available in large numbers thanks to slow sales out of remington in the u.s targeting spanish and south american markets they were already chambered for seven millimeter mauser a cartridge the navy was ordering 4,500 were ordered, and records indicate they were supposedly reserved for drill purposes only. However, we've seen evidence of their use on defensively armored merchant ships. So, Remington Rolling Block, as you probably noticed, is a single shot weapon. <laughs> it doesn't have a magazine, uh, so didn't really see a lot of frontline service when everybody else has bolt action magazine fed rifles, but could find quite useful second line action. Again, not a British weapon brought in from the States. Second line action, you know, sentry posts, back of uh, line guard duty, and in a Royal Navy context, a very useful thing to have around if you want to blow away the occasional sea mine that you might spot floating around, or take a pot shot at something that might be a sea mine, or might be a U-boat, or might be a random piece of floating driftwood. Understandably, they did get a little bit paranoid about that kind of thing. It's quite a nice lightweight gun, um, got quite a nice action on it, of course, uh, having to feed it bolt every time. It's uh, a little bit aggressive about ejecting the brass, but it is also ejecting the brass straight onto me, so, oh well. Um, then again, I am being a little bit of a, a lazy boy and sitting back and shooting this thing. I, if I was standing like a proper person should, then of course that wouldn't be happening and uh, should all be fine. So nothing to hold against it and uh, ooh, it's still just about warm. U.S. Winchester, model 1892. 
This American carbine would seem more at home in the Wild West, but its large capacity tubular magazine and Malder 4440 cartridge made it perfect for boarding and inspection operations. Light, handy, plenty of firepower at close range, and little fear of overpenetration. Upwards of 20,000 were ordered, though the rejection rate was over 10%. They were issued to torpedo boat destroyers and even Q-ships. It's also known they were used in the Zebra Grade. So, Winchester 92, 11 round magazine, absolutely beautiful weapon to shoot. I must confess I do have a 4.5mm CO2 powered version at home, but the real version is so much more fun. Um, sight's really nice, a lightweight gun, virtually no recoil. Royal Navy found them very useful, again, although American gun via Canada of all places, very useful for boarding actions. For one thing, you can actually load and well reload and fire this thing incredibly fast even compared to a bolt action the second it uses obviously these things see this one's been fired down range but it has a just a lead slug no copper or jacketing or anything like that so if you are taking part in a boarding action most likely an inspection but very occasionally rarely a boarding action you don't have to worry about shooting through the thin sheet steel that you might find on ships it'll just splatter uh, you won't get shrapnel and such any, anywhere around. And to be honest, it's um, it, I, obviously not looking down the barrel end of a live one, but it is a fairly intimidating thing to see someone boarding your ship with. So very effective from a psychological perspective. And I suspect as well, given the way that bolt actions work and the way you have to reload those as a compared to how quickly you can reload this lever action, if someone was resisting a boarding action and you had a party of... Uh, Royal Navy sailors or Marines coming down range just pumping out round after round after round, you're probably going to give up fairly quickly because it's um, psychologically not a good place to be in. <laughs> U.S. Remington, model 14 and one half. The other 4440 carbine in British service, Remington's pump action had just about the same benefits as the Winchester. 4,000 of these were contracted for with a singular note issued to miscellaneous craft and the RNAS. Further reference to, or images of these elusive pump guns, have not been found. But examples proofed in Canada for British delivery do turn up. Remington 14 and a half, again, American gun, some came through Canada, some came straight to the UK. 
pump action as opposed to lever action. Pretty much the same use as the previous gun that we just saw. Chambered in exactly the same uh, same round. This one obviously unfired with a bullet. Again, nice, nice side cartridge. It's kind of an intermediate cartridge. This is a rifle, not a shotgun or a, well, I suppose you could call it carbine with that length of barrel, but it is a rifle, but you could also load this round in a pistol, which makes it a very versatile round. So obviously able to keep a fairly decent rate of fire. Um, pretty nice kick to it. Um, and once again, pretty much like the Ross rifle, all the brass is ejecting stage right at uh, quite nice velocity. So all things considered, if I was participating in a boarding action, as the person doing the shooting, I'd probably prefer to have this one. As the person standing next to the guy doing the shooting, I'd probably prefer that he had the Winchester because, you know, brass coming straight across at me. Although, that said, if you were in the confines of a ship as opposed to on the deck, given the fact that the Winchester ejects straight up, it would be quite hilarious trying to dodge all the brass ricocheting off the ceiling. But that just appeals to me um, through sheer chaos. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty nice gun. Although, if I was given a choice of the two, I'd probably go for the Winchester. Uh, but absolutely nothing wrong with this thing, except for the fact it tries to eat your fingers when you're loading it. British Webley self-loader, Mark 1N. Technically, the official naval handgun, this was the first British automatic pistol chambering the unique 455 auto cartridge. This particular handgun never managed to replace the Webley revolver. It was especially slow to produce during the war, as Webley would be overwhelmed with army orders. Webley self-loading Mark 1N. N stands for naval. So before that, you had Webley revolvers. After that, you also had Webley revolvers. Apparently nobody liked the poor gun. Um, so most often found in the Royal Naval Air Service, as far as photographic evidence can be uh, seen, and bearing my Royal Naval Air Service is what the Royal Navy's air branch was called in World War I, thereafter became the fleet air arm. Uh, this one's loaded in 455 auto, so, and uh, well, it's got quite the little kick to it. It's a bit chunkier. It's basically kind of, to be honest, looking at it, it's what you'd think a 1911 drawn by a six-year-old looks like. Uh, it's all squares. <laughs> um, uh, having not yet shot a Webley revolver, I'm not entirely sure why they decided they were going to go away from it, but I'm sure I'm going to find out in a few minutes. U.S. Colt, model 1911. Thanks to the shortages, the U.S. Standard Colt 1911 pistol was purchased by the British forces in order to supplement their sidearms. Purchases would be made in its native 45 ACP, but also for a modification, allowing use of the British Standard 455 autoloader ammunition. So, Colt 1911, yeah, it's a US gun, but ended up in British service quite a lot. Uh, everyone thinks World War I, the British should have the Webley. Yes, they had the Webley, but they also had the 1911 in quite significant numbers. This one's in 45 ACP, they also existed in 455, although that was mostly with the Royal Flying Corps, somewhat with the Fleet Air Arm, Royal Navy, mostly the, the 45. Nice recoil and of course usefully locks open to tell you that it is um, actually spent <laughs> and uh, brass just happens to fly everywhere but you know nothing hit me so all good. British Webley Mark IV. The venerable Webley revolver was still the most common handgun available to the British Navy at the start of the war. Minor differences separate the Mark III, Mark IV, and V but we chose to go down the middle for our demonstration. This is, of course, the old Big Boar 455 rimmed cartridge, as we are well before the downscaling of the interwar period. <laughs> so 
So, Webley Mark IV, or number four revolver. Marks two through five are pretty much all the same thing. Uh, find them in the Royal Navy, of course. Mark VI is slightly different. It, the, <laughs> the, the single action is fun. It's very fun. Feel somewhat like you're actually there. Um, the double action, you might as well be trying to pull through concrete. <laughs> Comparing the two, I'm now kind of wor worried about why they <laughs> went back to this, if that's what the double action is like once they've gone through and actually developed the uh, the, uh, this, the auto loading one. Um, who knows, maybe the Mark VI is slightly better. <laughs> but I don't envy anyone trying to fire this thing double action. British Webley, Mark VI. Barring ergonomics from the more popular Webley private purchase and target revolvers, the Mark VI was better shaped for double action fire. It also sports a longer barrel and clear tall sights. This handgun was introduced during the war, and many feel it represents the best possible Marshall Webley of the period. So, Webley Mark VI, developed during the war uh, from a target pistol. Double action is a bit easier to use than the uh, other, um, the Mark IV, so definitely an improvement there. Quite fun to shoot, not a tremendous amount of recoil to be felt. <laughs> um, and also, interestingly enough, you can tell it's a Navy issue one because somebody has made sure there are Admiralty Broadhead arrows stamped on literally every single possible portion of this gun. You could literally blow this gun into a billion pieces and you still know it was a Navy piece. So, um, yeah, uh, of all the Webleys, this one on single action, probably my favourite. Uh, but if you have to fire more than one round at a time, then I'm still going to go with the box auto, boxy autoloader. Um, this one's not quite like pulling through concrete, more like pulling through treacle. <laughs> Spanish Old Pattern No. 2, Mark I. Desperate for more handguns, the British would contract with manufacturers in the Abar region of Spain. Known for their smaller workshops and largely handmade and hand-fit work, these producers could work together to provide large numbers of inexpensive guns quickly. Quality, however, was another matter. Being a simplification of the Smith & Wesson No. 3 Navy double action, these were dubbed the old model in British service and chambered the standard 455 revolver ammunition. Apparently I'm silly. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is an Orbea Ormanus. Um, pardon my Spanish. Uh, this is a, as the name suggests, Spanish-made gun. Vaguely Smith & Wesson-ish. That was kind of their inspiration. <coughs> Copy. Uh, not a standard issue weapon in the Royal Navy, but a weapon that was quite widely found through private purchase. When uh, once it was in British service, it was called either old pattern number one or number two, based basically on the grip. Um, this one, the single action, I'd say slightly inferior to a Webley. The double action, much superior to a Webley. So I can see why, if you were a British officer or really anyone who has issued with a sidearm and had the means to private purchase your own, you might go for something like this. Um, because, yeah, if you're going to stand and shoot and deliver, you know, one round very carefully aimed to the king's enemies, then sure, take a Webley, especially in uh, number six. Um, but if you actually, you know, have to shoot more than one target or you want to keep somebody down, definitely get one of these from the ones we've done so far. Unless, of course, you've got 1911, in which case, go 1911. U.S. Colt New Service, Mark I. 
Previously provided to the Canadian government, Colt New Service revolvers were already available in British 455, making them an obvious choice for a quality second standard sidearm. Sadly, there is a lot of confusion around just how many were ordered, but it seems to have been in excess of 40,000 units. So this is a Colt New Service. This is in British Naval Service, but prior to the war, it had been in US service, also been in Canadian service, which is probably where the British had heard of it. In American service, it's manufactured in 0.45. In British service, it's chambered in 0.455, which is, well, that's the standard British pistol round at this point. You get 455 Webley or 455 Auto. And well, it's got a really nice recoil. The double action is is very nice, uh, but I have a feeling I probably would do a bit better with it if I had American sized hands because, you know, Britain's a small island, so everything is scaled down, Xerox 95%. And uh, as you probably saw, as I was trying to actually fit it in my head, it is just a, a very big gun. So yeah, if I had American sized hands, I'd probably enjoy this weapon a lot more. I can feel it's a good weapon. I'm just a little bit too diminutive to use it properly. U.S. Smith & Wesson, Mark II. Like Colt, Smith & Wesson also had a large frame, 455 chambering triple action revolver on hand, ready to buy at the start of the war. However, it was the excessively fine and frankly over-engineered New Century, better known as the Triple Lock. By British request, this design was simplified into what would be the Mark II. Once again, I am an idiot. Uh, Smith & Wesson Mod 2. The reason it's Mod 2 is that it used to be called the Smith & Wesson Triple Lock. Triple Lock had lots of fancy gubbins up forward. The British got their hands on them because obviously Smith & Wesson is an American gun. They said, this is a, a bit silly. It's a bit too advanced for us. We just like it simplified. Smith & Wesson, okay, fine. If you want it with less bits on it, well, you can have it with less bits on it. And uh, did fairly good service in the war. Afterwards, Smith & Wesson went, hmm, we can sell these guns with a war-proven record. We don't have to put all the expensive, complicated stuff up forward. This sounds like a good idea. And so it went on to be sold continually. Obviously, in 455 Webley and British service, you can get the Amer American version of the Mod 2 in 45. And uh, yeah, pretty nice gun, pretty good double action, pretty good single action, um, very nice grip. Um, definitely, I think, one of my favorites amongst the revolvers so far. Um, so yeah, about the only thing I think I need to learn to do with this is a proper unload, because otherwise I just look like a, uh, a fool. <laughs> but you knew that already. British Webley Fosbury, model 1903. This commercial hybrid of an automatic pistol and old world revolver was thankfully chambered for the 455 revolver cartridge. However, it had repeatedly failed military trials and was barely being produced when the war broke out. Even in desperation, these were slow sellers, with small handfuls being purchased ad hoc for government use, presumably nowhere near the fighting. <laughs> so, the Webley Fosbury, possibly one of the least beloved <laughs> revolvers of all time. Um, it was a commercial pistol before the war. Um, the British Army and the Royal Navy did not want it in service because it was about as reliable as a British railway network. Um, wrong light, wrong temperature, uh, point it the wrong way, drink the wrong cup of tea in the morning, um, leaves on the line, uh, leaves on the ground, leaves on the hammer, any slight variation in conditions and this thing would not work. Um, <laughs> but Come wartime, you could put 455 in it, and some people were desperate enough to get something. 
So a few unlucky individuals ended up with the joyous task of having to maintain one of these blasted things in some of the most trying conditions of the early 20th century. Um, with all that said, it shoots relatively nicely. I mean, it's, it's a bit of an odd one in that you have to single action it to start with, but then the whole thing racks back and forth, so you, can sem you then semi-auto it like a 1911. In theory, this is great. Uh, in theory, it combines the, the, the lovable ability to uh, single action and draw down, which feels very nice, with the ability to mag dump, well, all six rounds, for what it's worth. In practice, not so much. <laughs> so yeah, very nice to shoot when it shoots. Um, if you have a tink uh, hankering for tinkering with uh, old bits of metal work in peacetime, sure, fine, fantastic, have one. It's a really, really nice piece. Um, in wartime, practice your throwing arm because you're probably going to be throwing this at your opponent at some point. And who knows, if you hit them on the head, you might be able to then steal a Luger and that might actually work. One of the more common uses for a naval rifle would be taking shots at floating sea mines. Generally, they were just riddled enough to sink, but sometimes the rifleman's efforts would be rewarded with a bit of a show. My God, Jack, we're in danger on this ship that we are obviously on in the <laughs> ocean. It's a sea mine. Clearly, it's very well done. We shall destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> A bit of a sticking up now. It's the last round. Happy British noises. <laughs> the day was saved. <laughs> now I am very sorry to say we ran short on time and therefore could not do a proper wrap up for this uh, collab. However, if you're a CN Arsenal patron, I did make him do a little podcast recording with me in the car on the way back home. If you'd like to learn more about these and other firearms, mostly from the Great War, but slowly branching out nowadays, then come on and check out our work over at Sea and Arsenal. Otherwise, y'all have a good one. So once again, huge, huge thanks to everyone at Sea and Arsenal for arranging all of that. And of course, also for putting up with the fact that I can't operate a cell phone in the United States because apparently um, roaming mobile data on a UK phone has two settings, internet or no phone, or phone but no internet. Uh, and so... In a separate story, which I've told on the dry dock, Athias actually had to come rescue me, dash, remind me uh, what the heck was going on while I was on USS Yorktown the previous day to all this filming. So, um, yeah, public apologies for, for my complete ineptitude when it comes to your cell phone technology. But, yeah, s so much thanks for myself and the rest of the crew for uh, letting us come down and experience everything that you guys have seen and a few things that 
and one or two things that are probably best left on the cutting room floor, like the look of utter befuddlement on my face at the sound of a spinning ricochet that sounded a bit like an angry metallic bee. But anyway, if you enjoyed that, then of course, please go and check out the CN Arsenal channel if you haven't already. And if you liked this kind of video, well, there's at least one more like this from the America trip to come. And of course, you know, I will be back in the States at various points over the next few years. So you never know. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.